Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Joel Bunch. I'm just a reference librarian here at the library. Um, and I uh, just want to talk to you about some housekeeping stuff and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Weedman and Dr. Fisher. Um, I'm going to be talking about their book, of course, while you're here. Uh, in your seat, you might have seen an evaluation form. If you'd like to give us your feedback, there's a box in the back. You can put that in. We appreciate that. I read um, every one of those for all of our adult events, so thank you uh, for that. And then um, if you need to use the restroom, they're just down this hall on your right by the water fountain. That's pretty much it. Um, tonight we are joined by Dr. Rob Weedman and Dr. Ray Fisher. They're going to be talking about their book, um, The Silken Thread, Five Insects and Their Impact on Human History. There is going to be a QA. and a um, They kind of want to do it organically, so as questions come up, um, I'll bring you a microphone. This is live stream, so when you say your question into the microphone, it'll be on the stream. So we ask that you do that. So if you just wait for me, I'll hand it to you. Um, I think that's it. So thanks again for coming. Oh, and uh, cookies are free available. We've got coffee and water, and then books are available for purchase in the back. Thank you all for coming. This is pretty exciting. Um, I think we should start by s saying how the book started. Is that what you want to say? Well, uh, a lot of the who, who's read the book or seen it, looked at it at all? Okay, a couple. Uh, <coughs> so the, the topics in the book really began as uh, lectures uh, from classes Ray and I have taught and now uh, taught by Dr. Jones in the back. Uh, and we met periodically, oh my goodness, for about a year, uh, probably once a month, uh, always at Hammond Trees. And so we call out Hammond Trees uh, in the preface to the book, thanking them. Um, and uh, then I guess it was about January of uh, 2020, we were... Uh, at that point, it started to solidify and uh, the ideas anyway. And I don't think Ray thought I was serious about it. And so he said, um, well, let's meet again in two weeks and uh, bring something. Uh, and so what I brought was uh, an outline, uh, a prospectus <laughs> to go to the publisher and uh, one, at least one chapter. Uh, yeah, it was more than one. Uh, well. <laughs> So at that point, he realized, okay, okay we're, we're serious about this. And then COVID came. And so uh, we had met a couple times before we were separated. And then we did virtually all this by Zoom. So um, some question, you know, wasn't that difficult? And you no, know, not really. And then others have said maybe it was easier because we avoided any bloodshed or fisticuffs uh, in the fights that we uh, had. It's hard to do those over Zoom. We managed. <laughs> yeah, we managed. But uh, anyway, so it was a, a wonderful collaboration, uh, partnership. Uh, we had fun. We learned. Uh, as I said, I learned something new every single day. And uh, my uh, poor, uh, um, I don't know what the right adjective is, wife who uh, was uh, the recipient of me every day saying, did you know this? And uh, so I, I say it only half in jest that she locked herself in her sewing room and stuffed a towel under the door so she wouldn't have to hear but just one more new thing. Uh, maybe it was paper towels. Maybe it wasn't really so. Uh, but anyway, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun to do. And, and hopefully it's fun. We'll read some fun things. Uh, what we would like to do is we'll read a couple things to start. And then if anyone has questions, um, simply raise your hand. Joel will come around with a microphone so they're, uh, they're captured. And if, we, if this is totally conversational after the first couple readings, great. Um, and otherwise, if there are silent spots, we'll go on and read something else. Uh, I told Joel that we had selected uh, 29 excerpts to read all of those uh, uh, taking about 45 minutes each, and so um, we we whittled them down to a fewer number and, and shorter segments uh, in the interest of not having everyone leave. So 
what you should hear in that is is please ask questions yeah. please speak up even if it's tell me more about that that's fine yeah and at some point i intend to ask ray a question too so uh, uh he's he's prepared so should we start okay well the book is called the silken thread and the reason it's called that is r underlying um all of these five insects is um, the silk roads of Asia and the silk moth really was the reason for the silk roads uh, and all the things that uh, that they led to. And oh yeah. Actually, c could I say one more thing of about course. the overview? Um, so now I'm, I'm seeing where, where we're going. I think it'd be useful to say the what we kind of decided to do is write a book about just five insects that were responsible for major right angles in human history. Uh, loads of insects have impacted human history, loads. Uh, but we, the challenge was to pick five that we thought were sort of gripping narratively. Um, and so that's, that's this, is, is those five, five insects. So we've broken it up broken these readings into five parts. We're going to read one starting with the moth and then break. Let's see. Anybody else have their say? Nobody does. We'll go to the second one. And what Rob is mentioning right now is that we noticed it's actually during writing that these five insects were not standalone, that each one was sort of a spinoff of the first, um, the first being silkworm, which we'll talk about in a moment. And that the silkworm responsible for the silk roads, the silk roads sort of created that right angle shift in the other four insects, hence the silken thread. So we'll get, to the, we'll explain this more, I think, but I just thought that'd be useful up front. Yeah. 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 This is the nice thing about working with Ray. All the things that I would forget, Ray, um, you know, well, what about this? You forgot that. And Actually, there was one point working on the plague, and we kept finding more and more and more. And uh, I was about to say, damn it, Ray, we don't need one more reference. And then he found one more reference, and it was the most important one in the entire book. And so uh, it was thank about you for that. About amoeba. <laughs> yeah, who so would have cool. thought amoebas? So the five insects, uh, I should explain, uh, the, the domestic silk moth, uh, human body louse, everybody loves body lice, um, the um, oriental rat flea, which uh, has a, uh, an in inappropriate place in history. Uh, everybody learned about rat flea and rats, and what we know is not, not true. Uh, we have um, western honeybee and um, the yellow fever mosquito. And so those are the five that represent the sections we'll, we'll talk about. So I'm going to start with uh, the beginning, actually, yeah. chapter one. <coughs> and the title of chapter one Ray came up with, and it's entitled Moth Spit. Moth Spit, that's hardly a glamorous descriptor for the robes and gowns of emperors and empresses. Nonetheless, spit from the young of certain moths has captivated humans for centuries. Although the moths are just doing what they've done for eons, secreting proteins from their mouths to spin into coco cocoons as part of their life cycle. Colloquially, we call that moth spit by a more refined name, silk. As with all moths and butterflies, Bombyx mori, which is the name of the moth, has a complete life cycle, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. The eggs are pinhead size, so small that it would take a thousand of them to tip the scales at one gram. A female silk moth can produce only about 500 eggs over a few days, so two females would be required to yield one gram of eggs. For this first step in production, about a thousand eggs are placed onto large bamboo trays and covered with by mulberry leaves. The larvae, once hatched, multiply their weight 10,000 fold in roughly a month if kept at the ideal temperature. Read that again. 
a 10,000 fold weight gain in 30 days. The initial gram of eggs would now be 10 kilograms. Uh, caterpillars can be considered the teenagers of the insect world. Just like human teenagers, insect teenagers have ravenous appetites. However, even human teenagers don't gain that much weight, thankfully. Parents would need more or larger refrigerators in their home. Uh, um, as the mulberry leaves are consumed, they're replaced with fresh leaves, and this process requires that the larvae be cared for almost continuously. Four trays of a thousand eggs, even accounting for mortality, eventually will produce about one kilogram of silk. One kilogram? Silk is very light, so one kilogram is a lot of silk, about enough to make one skirt and blouse combination or about 60 neckties. Yes, one kilogram of silk is a lot of silk, but we're jumping ahead. So that's introducing our Silk uh, was used in ancient China for a lot of things. Used as currency, paying soldiers, doing other uh, things. Uh, well there were no coins, there wasn't uh, money, so payment was um, uh, in many cases made by silk, but uh, payments were not only for uh, soldiers or, or workers. Uh, silk was also the primary currency for payments made to keep peace. Paying for peace amounted to little more than extortion, but the Chinese emperor was willing to make the payments to avoid attacks on their outlying cities. One fierce tribe, the Xiongnu, and I may be mispronouncing it, was the most feared and most demanding of the nomads. Their tribal leader periodically requested meetings with the Chinese emperor. At those meetings, the Shan Yu, the tribal leader, collected his gifts, which consisted of rice, wine, and most desired, silk. Silk was a symbol of power and status, and so it was highly desired as a tribute for payment. Going ahead, the staggering costs of payments continually increased, but the cost was considered to be less than losses from a raiding tribe, and so the emperor was willing to pay, up to a point. As with all extortion ploys, this one reached a tipping point, and the emperor was advised that paying the escalating cost of maintaining peace was no longer wise. One might say that the greed or status-seeking was like a later version of Aesop's fable of the goose and the golden egg, in this case, a silken egg. The system of trade and paying for extortion all happened because of silk, held by the emperor and desired by the tribes Shan Yu. The payments by the emperor reflected the size of the accompanying retinue visiting the emperor's court as he desired or distributed silk among those accompanying him. Hey guys. Um, for a number of years, the emperor limited the number of uh, the entourage to 200 However, for the visit in the year 1 BCE, the Shanyu requested that he be allowed 500 followers. Begrudgingly, the emperor relented, which resulted in payment of the unfathomable amount of 30,000 rolls of silk, each weighing half a kilogram, or just over one pound, the same number of fabric pieces and 300 suits of clothing. So let those amounts sink in for just a moment, considering how that payment could have been made. Just the silk rolls alone amounted to 15,000 kilograms of finished silk. That's 15 metric tons of silk. Imagine the effort by the emperor to sustain the level of payment, initially for extortion and only later for homage. Consider the, the entire supply chain. We have some supply chain people here in the audience. Growing mulberry leaves, feeding the silkworms, harvesting the silk, weaving the cloth, then collecting the products. From how many individual homes and workshops and over what area did the empire need to collect to make the payment of 30,000 rolls of silk, plus the fabric and items of clothing? And what about the army of workers that would have been necessary to coordinate 
and make those collections plus deliver that amount? And then, how do the Zhang Nu get their parting gifts home? That's a lot of silk. I, I like that last point. How did how did they get it home? <laughs> like, that's there you are without trucks, you know, and you've got just basically horses, of which there are plenty. But thirty thousand is that's a lot of just yeah. space. Well, yeah, five hundred uh, accompanying him, but still, how do you get all of that home? Yeah. And, and it wasn't a trivial distance to go home either. Anyway, so that's our, our silk section. Uh, introduction to that. Yes, we have a question. You mentioned 1 BC, I think. When, when did we first start making silk or using silk? How far back in history? So that's a really cool question, um, and it turns out it's really hard to answer um, because what we know is accounts of silk making, and those accounts, written accounts, uh, occurred long, long after uh, domestication took place. And domestication took place on a northern population of these wild silk moths in um, northern China, basically. And that area uh, is not the only place that was doing this. So uh, we've made this point here of um, moth spit becoming silk, and we're talking about silkworms. One thing we didn't say here, but we say in the book is, you know, this is a standard practice in the group called Lepidoptera, moths and butterflies. They all make silk. Uh, they all have moth spit. And so various species by various cultures, including in this region of China, have been, um, they've, they've been trying to make, um, s well, silk or uh, uh, derivations of that for as long as we can look for it. Least seven thousand years. So I'd like to imagine that the domesticated animals that make a product and this is different than domesticated products in which you can see uh, hours with uh, with moth spit that they you know might be alive hundreds of years could be useful. But in the beginning of their The end of this first chapter uh, talks about different fabrics, and so if silk was reserved for the emperor, what did everybody else wear? And so we talked a bit about wool and cotton and um, linen from flax, and, and so uh, all of these have very uh, ancient origins. Uh, wool that you might think, well, that's really ancient, may have been one of the more recent, but, um, but silk at least, there's knowledge of going back that far. The only th other thing I'd like to add to that is that information is coming from so many sources. So to find out that age, we're looking at archaeological evidence, but we're also looking at like molecular evidence of the evolution of the moth. Um, domestication is a fascinating process. Um, it's essentially just a mutualism with a human. That's what we call domestication in, in a way. And uh, you can date those evolutionary events with DNA changes, and of course they're doing this, but the results don't give you like a clock. It's a huge range, and uh, and so yeah, seven thousand is, is is what we what we've said. But it's it's worth pointing out that um, it's reasonable. It's very reasonable that it's dating far far older than that. Just great question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's a fun question. Um, yes, sir. Miss Dr. Jones. Or you can shout out. You can. <coughs> I 
I'm just curious about the term silk itself and that coming about in language because uh, Lepidoptera are not the only ones that produce a substance that is similar to that that we refer to as silk. And so I'm curious as to whether the term silk originated around the moth spit itself or was that a term that was already around for something else when silk was discovered or was it something applied to like spider web at that point in time because now we refer to those things as silks but is that which came first the chicken or the egg kind of a thing I guess with the term the silk itself or the term and how are we relating those just some history on the term so uh, in, in a brief nod I think we can both confidently say that we don't know um, but I, I do have something to say about that. So, uh, so linguistically, I, I don't have a comment. I, I really don't know. Uh, good question, and I'd like to know now. I know what I'm doing tonight. <laughs> um, but I can comment about silk, the English word, and its use, So, uh, which may indirectly get at what you might be asking. Uh, so... Biologically, we describe silk as a liquid substance that is produced by, I'll just broadly say, an animal um, that then, let's say, hardens into an elastic, strong thread. That definition is extraordinarily broad and encompasses an outstanding diversity of chemicals, origins. It's been evolved in independently multiple times in fly across different flies, across hymenoptera, independent of, uh, hymenoptera wasps, ants, bees, independent of, or thought independent of uh, moths uh, because they're using different structures. Spiders, the use of spider silk is not consistent. So they use their spinnerets uh, and glands and their spinnerets to produce silk, silk. <laughs> but you may not know that primitively, primi ancestrally, spider feet have pr can produce silk as well. Um, spiderlings and tarantulas and other older spiders they can produce silk out of their feet. Or spitting spiders, which spit a venom at their prey and cover their prey up, that's called silk too, and that's directly related to venom glands. Uh, the proteins have absolutely nothing to do with with silk in other spiders, and that's just spiders. So uh, mites produce silk. Uh, there are uh, shrimp that produce a silk-like substance, uh, and so on and so on. And we're not even talking about uh, silk-like fabrics that can be derived from plants. So the the short end, the the point I'm trying to get at is um, historically, linguistically. Etymologically, there's a fascinating story with the word silk, but I think there's actually more interesting things to say about what we're doing with silk now. If I, if I go to an arachnology conference and use the word silk, I mean something very different than if I go to Walmart and say the same word, and that diversity is fascinating. And again, it's not something special about arachnology. If I go to a hymenopterist convention, those are both entomologists, those are two completely different words, silk and silk. So, yeah. So we don't know. D don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, and, and so just to follow up on what Ray is saying, the, so this, is, this uh, liquid is produced in salivary glands of these caterpillars. You have salivary glands. So do these, these larvae. Um, in your case... Uh, anybody here that weighs 220 pounds, uh, you've got three salivary paired salivary glands, and they have a mass of about 3.4 ounces. So you weigh 200 pounds, 3.4 ounces of s uh, salivary glands, or less than 0.1 percent of your body mass. For silkworms, their salivary glands, their caterpillar weigh 50 percent of their body weight so salivary glands are important to you they're incredibly important to a silkworm uh, half their body weight so a uh, little bit different than than we do they also track down the whole body of the yeah you could if you stretch them out i think it's like 10 times the length of the 
the body. So it really involves. Uh, I forgot we did have one other, um, and we're not going to get through these 29 readings. I know that, uh, which is good. Um, who here has a cell phone? And I don't, you don't need, I mean, everybody has cell phones. So this part applies to you. And this uh, was one of the lectures I would give in, in uh, class, and it was always fun at the end of it. Uh, so this is, uh, with the innovations generated by the Industrial Revolution, the textile industry was benefited with advances in the cotton industry also made through spinning. But the silk industry benefited more from advances in weaving. Punch card looms made their appearance in 1775, and improvements made by Joseph-Marie Jacquard produced the Jacquard loom at the turn of the 19th century. His machine used a series of connected punch cards to be processed in a defined sequence, producing complex and detailed patterns that could be made repeatedly, enabling mass production. Several different outcomes ensued from the introduction of this loom. First, complex silk patterns prior to the, this loom required a master weaver paired with an assistant who sat on top of the loom and raised and lowered warp threads manually. This new loom produced quality woven textiles by an unskilled worker in much less time, reducing the number of workers needed. Because there was a reduction in number of skilled workers, there were, uh, and the unskilled workers then were employed in with poor working conditions, paid poor wages, and that led to worker revolts. The initial uprising in 1831, when the workers took control of the silk district in the city of Lyon, France, was the first known worker revolt. The second uprising, three years later, lasted six days and was quelled by 12,000 armed French soldiers, uh, killing 300 of the rioters. Third, the need for fewer workers and faster production led to lower cost, and they were affordable then to a broad market of consumers. The fourth outcome affected the world greatly and still affects you today. The punch card that enabled quick production of silk patterns was a technology that found other uses, one of those extending across the Atlantic to the U.S. A gentleman named Herman Hollerith graduated from Columbia University School of Mines in 1879 and was employed the following year by the U.S. Census Bureau. The Census Bureau needed a way to tabulate census data better and more quickly than the hand entries and counting that had been used previously. Hollerith, employed as a statistician, followed up on an idea of a co-worker to create a device similar to the Jacquard loom to automate the count. He designed a machine to punch holes in paper cards with the location of the holes indicating individual characteristics and another machine to tabulate the information. His machine was tested on the collected 1880 data, yielding results that closely ma matched the hand-counted data close enough that he was granted a contract for the 1890 census. He was also granted a PhD for his an invention. That doesn't ever happen anymore. Um, and a medal at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Three years later, he founded the Tabulating Machine Company based in Washington, D.C. Again, granted a contract for the 1900 census. He believed he alone could provide the technology, so he inflated the prices, resulting in the Census Bureau developing a counting machine for their own use, which the government then patented. Uh, while the legal battle was uh, ongoing, Hollerith sold the company, which became part of a conglomerate called the Computer Tabulating Recording Company. He was still a consulting engineer. In 1914, the company hired a new director named Thomas J. Watson, led the company as it improved both tabulating machine and sales, setting the company on, ta on stable footing. Watson changed the name of the again successful company to the International Business Machines Corporation, later known as IBM. Yes, that IBM. Your computer, laptop, tablet, and cell phone are descendants of the card reading tabulating machine that was patterned after an automated loom for weaving silk. 
that silk being the product of the salivary glands of the domesticated moth. The le next time you log on or answer a text, think of silk, the silken threads made from moth spit. So those of you that are listening or looking at your phone instead of listening to me, um, this is why you're able to do that. I, th <coughs> I think that's one of my favorite stories, one of my tops in this in the whole book. Or am I doing oh, the next? Oh, one? Yeah. oh yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> we actually practiced this or re rehearsed it. <laughs> yeah. Can't believe it. <laughs> Six-minute phone call earlier today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, this next, so that's it for moths. We're moving on to the next insect. Uh, would anybody like to make a comment or a question about moths, silk moths, silkworms? Yes. You mentioned Walmart and then uh, uh, like what they think silk is versus what silk is. What's what do they think it is versus you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was referring to silk, the fabric, versus the biological. Um, the so in, in I, I was mentioning that there's sort of uh, a pluralism with the just the English term silk, and we're yeah. And product versus uh, the, the uh, initial the starting point. So a biologist, a biologist <laughs> is thinking of the beginning point, that which is extruded from the animal. The the retailer or whomever is selling the final product, which is a silk uh, shirt or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, th so really different both ends of the of the production, I guess. Have moths fit, yeah. Yeah. I actually have a follow-up question on this. Um, do you talk about in the book the uh, processing involved in taking the uh, the biological project or um, the biological product and then making taking that to the the finished silk shirt? Yeah, we we actually spend a fair amount of time with the the spinning and and how much it takes and how the threads are woven together and um, uh, how it's collected uh, from the um, uh, from the cocoons. The, s the cocoon that a silk moth caterpillar makes that is made of one single strand of extruded silk and it's, what is it, like nearly a kilometer long. So six, you know, a thousand meters of a single strand that's woven. And so you, to get that out, you have to uh, process it and that involves heat in order to break down some of the proteins, but not all of them. And those that, that um, make the silk sticky and stick to each other are broken down. So that allows uh, unwe unwinding that cocoon. But single strand, which is pretty remarkable. Austin was talking about spiders and and the threads that are that are made for a, uh, a web those are not single strands they're shutting on and off yes we had one other you actually just kind of answered it okay. in a way i was thinking like if i buy a product a silk shirt right now is that really that's just the silk that came from the animal that you you know, just changed a little bit with this heat process like this. That's amazing. I didn't realize it was still all natural there. Yeah. I don't know if you want to. Oh. No, no. Oh. It, it's cool stuff. Other comments before we move on? Okay. Okay, so this next section, uh, this is, we've gone over one insect and silkworm and the silk moth. Now we're moving to uh, oriental wrap fleas. 
uh, and this is a, uh, we've decided, we've picked a few readings out of this, but we've decided to go for more conversation about this topic since it's slightly more difficult to cover uh, without reading all the chapters, m less more so than the than the moth, I think. And so, and so, uh, yeah. So what we're dealing with is three pandemics of bubonic plague, or the the plague. And um, those pandemics are not the only occurrences of plague. People get plague every year today. Um, there's plague in the southwestern U.S. in, um, uh, I'm blanking, not groundhogs, what am I thinking, but what's the, ro the pra prairie dogs, prairie dogs, um, which incidentally we do have subpopulations of here due to the wild animal safari uh, up in, what is that, gentry, and what's interesting about that is I don't think anybody's checked for plague in those animals, so who knows what's going on. Anyway, my point is, Plague is ever present, but we are dealing with these two, these three massive outbreaks of plague. Uh, well known, these the uh, if you open a history book, they will talk about three pandemics. And um, what is interesting about that is that there is a well known story associated with this. This story is what I mean when I say well known. It's covered in TV. It's covered in history books. We've taught it in courses. I've taught it in general entomology courses. I've been taught it in general entomology courses. Everyone I know teaches this. It's a great story. And uh, it is this story. It is that uh, rats, mostly brown rats, carry a flea called oriental rat flea. It's the common name of the flea. And that flea develops through feeding a plug in its uh, throat, basically, if you want to call it that, that uh, harms the flea. It ends up dying, <laughs> basically, of starvation. But that plug is enabling it to sort of barf back up some of this bacteria called Yersinia pestis back into the host. And uh, so that is, Yersinia pestis is the causative agent of plague. And this is how it's been explained how we get it. Rats, rat flea, humans. That's how we get Yersinia pestis, the plague. There's some interesting bits about how rats get plague that were not known until recently. But once rats get it, it's right up to humans. Well, it turns out that this explains well the third pandemic, which now I'm blanking on the dates. Do you have the dates memorized? It's late 1800s not 1900s yeah yeah i guess that's fair enough i was looking for exact dates but oh. um but <laughs> yeah so so um yeah so turn of the 1900s you've got the third pandemic this is happening in um eastern asia and uh that indeed was it was found out in the 1900s that this sequence from rat mostly brown rat to oriental rat flea, to human, is what caused that pandemic. Because we figured that out as a human investigation, we just applied that explanation to the previous two pandemics. And it, that is what I'm saying that we've all learned and taught. And it turns out that's completely wrong. Uh, and there's so many interesting facets of why that is not the right story. So. The second pandemic is what is colloquial no colloquially known as the Black Death in Europe. You've all heard of the Black Death. That's the most famous. It's the most famous because not only did it kill more people, but it also the mortality rate was higher. So it actually, um, the, the everything about that pandemic was more deadly. Yeah, let's see, how do I want to proceed after that? So the, the, the second pandemic, the Black Death, is the one that we know best, but the one that is not applied to this common story of rat, rat flea to human. And so the question comes, well, what caused it then? How did this happen? And it turns out that the story of that pandemic is similar to the first, where 
it's thought you get these um, r these trading routes from East Asia, where Yersinius pessis is thought to have originated, mostly on rodents, and it's transported along fur trade, silk road, and boat routes to sort of southwest or southeastern Europe, and that's how the first pandemic started and that's how the second pandemic started but notice that that's not where the black death happened to get to black death you've got to go northward up into proper europe and it turns out that uh, there's all kinds of problems with both the flea the rat genetic studies on the bacteria where those came from and just the rate that it happened people were dying too fast so to point at rat fleas and rats as the causative agent doesn't make any sense. In the book, I, l I really love, this is one of my favorite sections, I think, that we wrote because uh, almost every hour we, we had our jaws on the floor. We're like, wait, what? <laughs> I didn't know that. This is, we're wrong about this too? Okay, now I've got it. And then a few hours later, read something else oh my gosh, we're wrong about that. And then it's a constantly evolving story. I just checked this morning and it turns out this year there's even more updates on what's happening. So uh, how this, how the Black Death happened, how the first two pandemics happened is a continually evolving story and one that we actually don't know that well. If you just want the short answer, I'll go ahead and just give the short answer and then we'll backtrack and say how we got there. The short answer is we think it's, it's lice. It's still an insect. In fact, it's the next insect we cover. But uh, we th the human-to-human -human rate of transition is very fast, and that is matching the speed of the deaths in the Black Death as it traveled northward in a way that rats couldn't do. Uh, the way the disease cycles through rat, rat, flea, and human is far too slow for it to account for that. And also the, the players weren't in place oh, right. when, uh, when the Black Death occurred. So uh, the Norway rat or brown rat uh, didn't occur in Europe until, what, 1600, somewhere in there. We're talking about a pandemic occurring in the 1300s. And so, wait a minute, if, if the rat's not there, how does that happen? Well, the rat got, got the, uh, the plague to the port and then it moved through different uh, animals from there. But then the, the, the kicker was the human to human, and that would involve lice. As we were going through this, and Ray said, you know, jaw dropping each time, I was reminded in the 1970s there was a comedy troupe called Fire Sign Theater, and they had an album that was entitled Everything You Know Is Wrong. And that's what we felt like as we were writing this this section, we'd get to where, oh, that's it. No, that's not it. There's still another part to it. May I ask you a quick question? Yes. In light of these findings, uh, uh, what has been the uh, response from the historical commu community? Oh, that's a wonderful question. So, uh, yeah, uh, as you might as you might guess, up upheavals like this don't sit well, um, in, p in, in particular uh, from cross disciplines. Um, and so there have been pretty, uh, I mean, the it, honestly, the papers are fun to read uh, because they, there are personal attacks writ in those publications pretty regularly. I mean, I don't, I don't know, maybe this, this is dealing uh, around a time about what, uh, 2010s is when we started thinking in these ways. Um, but I'll say a couple more things about that. So, so contentious and not well is the direct answer, but there's a couple other interesting aspects. One is that uh, the cause of the, 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 the actual disease cycle has been debated for a long time outside of evidence. So this is outside of historians, outside of people doing genetic work on the disease, outside of people, you know. Um, it, so for example, in, in many medical fields, people have come up with various explanations for how the bacteria itself can be transmitted, let's say in a lab. 
And so w- there was a period in the 1990s where, oh, um, 19, yeah, 1990s, where we, they thought that the, that the plague was transmitted aerially. And what's interesting about that is that sometimes it apparently can be, but only under specific circumstances and unrelated to the pandemics. Um, but that got circulated for a while. So there was sort of like a already like a question mark around the topic. So it wasn't maybe as contentious as it could have been. Yeah. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, cool. I wanted, I wanted to say one more thing about something you said about the rats. You know, oh, by the way, the rat wasn't even there. Well, you might wonder, well, maybe it was another rat. You know, there's other rats. Maybe the rat flea got there a different way. Never mind that rat fleas aren't in archaeological digs of that time, whereas other uh, parasites are. Maybe they just missed it, right? Well, it turns out that Yersinia pestis can't survive in fleas at all. Um, it's only capable of surviving in the body of a flea due to this one mutation in a gene called, like, what is it, like YNT or something like that. And if you just do basic evolutionary research, you can actually date that occurrence of when that mutation arose. And it was after the first two pandemics. So it's not fleas. (laughs) And it's one of those where you look at it from almost every line of evidence and you just thunk once again and again and again on the realization that it's not fleas, it's not the rats, it's not the, you know, you just keep saying no to these things and you're sort of left without an explanation. Okay. And so that that chapter that was written about sorting out the plague, we wrote it. Some of you are old enough to remember uh, the TV show Columbo, uh, Detective. So it was written like this, uh, you know, this detective in a rumpled, uh, uh, top coat, but he, but Columbo was known for saying, uh, oh, "Oh, just one more thing," and so th- each time we're getting, we, we get to a point and get, oh wait, there's just one more thing, and then that takes us another way, and and all the the cases of nope, it didn't happen that way, it didn't happen that way, but it was um, I- invoking Columbo for that. But one one thing that we have today, in addition to quarantine in the Southwest, is. I mean, uh, plague in the Southwest is the word quarantine, and it really came about because of the plague. And in 1374, where the ships were arriving in Venice, and the port officials kept the ships offshore for uh, what they well, first they did 30 days, known as a trentena, uh, and then they set up a, a process to isolate travelers for 40 days known as the Quaranta Giorno, or the Quarantena. And so the, the words come from that 40 days of isolation to keep from bringing the bacteria, the disease on shore. So what we, what we have today had its origins because of the plague. So I'm just curious how to show of hands, does anybody know that story of rat fleas, rats, and plague? Can I just get a show of hands? Hi, just actually curious. Yeah, wow, okay, so. Like, we all know it. How many people have taught that? Just me? Oh, okay, <laughs> three of us. Awesome. Yeah, I, I just think that's amazing. I, can I say something about amoebae? <laughs> cool. Okay, so uh, the reason that I like this story is not just because it's fascinating. It is fascinating. But I love this story because... I think you had just about had it with the references. I th- I don't know how many references I I amassed on it, it, it two 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 too many oh <laughs> <laughs> too many yes indeed yeah so uh, I think this was the only time during the whole writing maybe one other that that there was any sort of conflict and the conflict was very light so but uh, but. Yeah, I got I got pretty into the references here, and just when you just about had it with how much there was, I found this thing about amoebae, and it goes like this. So, I told you that um, there's the rodent, the flea, and then the human, 
And if you don't like that, there's the rodent, the flea, the human, and then a bunch of lice and humans, right? Well, how do the rodents get this Yersinia pestis in the first place? If you go do a survey of mammals looking for Yersinia pestis in the mammals, you can find it sometimes, but not at zoonotic levels. Zoono zoon a zoonosis is a, uh, is a word that means there's a reservoir of that in an animal population. So that's where the disease is, and then it jumped over to humans, for example. It's basically a way to think of zoonosis. But you don't find zoonoses in uh, the plague, not at levels that make any sense. You can get one-offs every now and then, but not at these kinds of levels. So how are they getting it if they aren't storing the bacteria there? And it turns out that we can date the evolution of Yersinia pestis, the bacterium, and figure out where it came from across all bacteria. And it comes from another bacteria called Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. And pseudotuberculosis is a soil bacterium. It lives in dirt. And uh, you can, th there are cases, hence pseudotuberculosis, there are cases where uh, people will inhale dust and get these these bad symptoms and stuff from, from this, this bacterium as well. But that's where Yersinia pestis comes from. And this is obvious. You've got burrow-dwelling rodents that are in dirt. There's a bacterium. It's in dirt. It's easy, right? They just they get the bacteria and they transmit it, and it's done. Well, it turns out that the bacterium actually can't live in dirt at all. So if you just if you had a handful of Yersinia pestis, which I don't recommend doing, and just throw it in some dirt, it would they every one of them would die in moments. They can't survive. There are many bacteria that can. Yersinia pestis, the plague, is not one of them. So how or is this dirt bacterium living in dirt so well as to be pulled up by rodents so well as to be passed off to humans? See? Well, it turns out that there's this weird mutation that these bacteria have, similar to what I mentioned with the flea and living in the flea body, uh, that gives them this superpower. So in soil, there's boatloads of microorganisms, and most of them are single-celled. Single and most things that are eating bacteria, I think, are sing single-celled organisms. And amoebae are a great example of this. And so uh, they've done these studies where uh, the bacterium can't survive in the dirt, but they're commonly fed upon by all these predatory other single-celled animals or, or creatures. If an amoeba ingests Yersinia pestis to feed upon it, then that bacterium, upon being eaten, sets off a genetic chain reaction to encapsulate itself and chemically prevent it from being digested by the amoeba. And that's actually how it survives in the dirt. It's not living in the dirt. It's living in the guts of single-celled organisms that live in the dirt. So rodents are not eating bacteria. They're eating amoebae that have the bacteria. And just think about how wonky that is to talk about a chain of events all the way up to the Black Death, and it's reliant on predatory amoebae not eating properly, right? <laughs> so the I'll, I'll say one more thing about this fascinating paper, and that is that um, amoebae aren't living everywhere in the soil either. So it turns out if you just sample a bunch of soil, especially in the arid areas where the a lot of these rodents are originating, uh, that's too dry, so the amoebae can't live there. So now I've just told you there are bacteria in the amoebae, and now I'm telling you that the amoebae aren't there, so where are they? And it turns out that the, th the theory is that infected rodents eventually die, and there they sit, and it's kind of goopy under them, and that's where the amoebae are, <laughs> and that's it. So eventually you get burrowing rodents sniffing up the kicked up juicy dirt 
a needy filled juicy dirt from their dead bedfellows and that's that's how we get it i don't know but to me that's amazing i i wanted to point out that the words goopy and wonky are uh are uh, biological uh special you have to be a specialist to use those with sincerity uh the way that ray does uh, so yeah thank you for those but yeah, it, uh, I've I've gotten over the the riff that we had about that, and it r it truly was the the best reference in the whole book. So, um, should we jump ahead, or or are there questions? Any discussion about the plague or uh, the different pandemics? It's, I mean, th the parallels between that and and the pandemic ongoing uh, are remarkable and uh, transmissions and numbers and rates and s and so forth uh, um, and there's a reason things are happening the way they are the processes are very similar okay should we where do you want to jump to Okay, all right. So this is about uh, lice, and this part of it uh, has to do with Ireland and the, the great hunger that occurred because of the um, plant pathogen that uh, affected the potatoes. Potatoes were the staple uh, food of people in Ireland in, in the 1800s, and the amount of co potatoes consumed was staggering. And we first found this figure and we couldn't believe it, so we went and found another source that confirmed it independently. And then still a third one, which a slight difference, but basically that an adult male was consuming 14 pounds of potatoes a day. This is all they were eating, and there's not a whole lot of nutrition in a potato, and so you have to eat a bunch of it to, uh, to get any nutrients. So it's something like 40 to 60 potatoes a day. Um, any of the, you that peel potatoes can imagine what that would be like. But anyway, the w when the, the um, uh, potato blight came and that was no longer uh, uh, food available and, and the great hunger began, people were trying to leave Ireland and many of them were crossing the Atlantic. Uh, to come to America, and the um, the ships that carried them were not equipped uh, to carry passengers. Some of them were old ships made to carry uh, lumber or timber. Excuse me. One that was supposed to um, carry 155 passengers had 276 on board. There were 36 berths, so places to sleep for 276 passengers. Four of those were for the, uh, for the crew. Uh, no sanitary facilities, crowded together in a hold with no ventilation. Well, the problem with that, and then th there was insufficient food, there was insufficient water uh, because they weren't required to uh, take care of the passengers. And many of those passengers that went on board had lice and they had lice carried typhus. And typhus is not a very forgiving disease. So you have these ships leaving Ireland, overcrowded, people crowded together, um, so passing lice from one to another, passing typhus from one to another. And so these ships were known as coffin ships. And so uh, the passengers leaving Ireland seeking refuge abroad uh, found hellish voyages that were deadly. When ship fever broke out, the passengers were sickened and confined to an unventilated hold in the dark, no sanitary facilities, no food, and no water. One account estimated 8,000 passengers died en route, but that's likely to be far too low. More than 400 ships, later called the Fever Fleet, disgorged their human cargo in Canada, so that estimate works out to only 20 fatalities per ship. 
Well, one of the ships that left Ireland with 476 passengers, 158 died on board. Another 106 were ill on landing in Canada and died. Another uh, convoy, 810 passengers of two ships, 268 died. So this estimate of 20 per ship is a little low. Uh, and so uh, they were called coffin ships, but that name was ironic because those dying on board were thrown into the sea, and those who were dead on arrival were buried in mass graves. In both cases, no coffins. Um, and the th the treatment that they were given, they were tried to be uh, cared for by those, uh, especially there were nuns in the uh, Catholic order, uh, but of 40 nuns that, that cared for patients in Montreal's fever shed. These fever sheds were buildings where they would put everybody who was sick, and they were crowded together. They were, again, just wooden planks that they would put two or three people in each bunk, uh, almost no water. People had to wait hours. You can imagine those of you that have had fever waiting hours to get any sip of water. So these uh, nuns, uh, 40 of whom cared for the ill, uh, 30 of them became sick and seven of them died. Priests attending uh, and giving last rites died uh, within days. And so uh, it the Irish were leaving one uh, known death, that being starvation, but then going on these ships that were filled with uh, lice and typhus were from the frying pan to the fire, use uh, another analogy. It was, it was not a, a relief for them at all. Um, I think that was... It was a little paraphrasing, but that was most about the, the lice. Um, people, uh, well, the unfortunately, the, the uh, camps during World War II, um, many of the deaths in those camps were, were uh, typhus. Uh, and so one that we all read about, everybody knew about, Anne Frank dying in, in one of the camps died of typhus, she and her sister. Um, so uh, it was rampant there and in any other place where there were uh, crowded conditions. And that's often the case after um, war or after a um, um, uh, large disaster of some sort where you have people crowded together and that just gets spread from one to the next. One of the things about in early England, um, and uh, it was called jail fever uh, because people crowded together uh, and it later found it was moved by clothing. But um, prisoners hauled before the judge and because of mingling of clothing, the, the sheriff that was hauling the prisoner would get lice, would get typhus. Even the judges in these uh, cases were getting those. So a judge issuing a death sentence, and at the time in England, 1700, there were something like 240 uh, crimes that that got the death sentence, but many more people died from typhus than they were killed by, uh, by the, the judges, but the judges themselves were getting uh, the lice and typhus, so issuing a death sentence, but in effect getting one themselves, so curious insight. Yeah, I, I think I, I don't have a lot to add there. It just sort of stands on its own. That that entire so I I didn't know that story um, of the transport from the of the Irish to the New World. I didn't know that story, um, and learning about it is sobering. The accounts from that time are uh, gruesome. So uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing, that's a great place to spend some reading. There's lots of material on it. So we're talking about gruesome ways to die. That <laughs> Well, we could have done that, the, the pits. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we didn't get to that. Okay. Well, yeah, so uh, do you want to move on? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we can move on unless somebody has a comment or question about lice. Okay. Well, you find your place. Or something. Oh, there's the anecdote, one of the notes in there. Our, when our daughter was young, uh, she loved rice. 
absolutely loved it. And uh, but Emily didn't uh, couldn't say her her uh, L's and R's for a long time, and so we were at a a restaurant in in San Antonio, and and my wife took our son to the restroom, and while they were gone, they brought a plate of rice, and Emily was so excited, and she saw Luann across the restaurant and yelled as loud as she got, could, Mom, we've got lice! And she <laughs> said that, you know, much to the dismay of everybody at nearby <laughs> tables, and so, uh, yeah, check, please. Fantastic. Okay, well, uh, so we've gone through uh, three of the five insects. We've gone through silkworms, we've gone through fleas, and now we've gone through uh, human lice. And so we're moving on to the fourth uh, insect, which is mosquitoes, um, and specifically yellow fever mosquitoes. So uh, there's lots to say about this. I'm going to do a reading here on, on the beginning of this. Um, yeah, actually, I'll just start. I'm not an excellent reader, so forgive me. Uh, OK. History is not a dry list of events. It is a web of complex connections. Seemingly disparate actions and people converge, generating a story. How did you learn history? Hopefully as a series of rich tales that enlivened events both significant and seemingly minor. Too often, history is taught without the underlying color, making connections between topics difficult to see. The focus of this section is yellow fever mosquitoes. The species name is Aedes aegypti or Aedes aegypti. And a disease that they carry. In this chapter, we'll weave a number of seemingly disparate threads together and extend the Silk Roads west to the Americas. Before we dive into mosquito biology or yellow fever, we must first address some questions. Where did yellow fever and the mosquito come from? And how did yellow fever get to the Americas? After all, yellow fever and yellow fever mosquitoes are not native to the Americas, but to islands off of the coast of southeastern Africa. Short answer, the, tran the transatlantic slave trade. The answer may seem straightforward. Europeans brought yellow fever and yellow fever mosquitoes from Africa to the Americas, but not so fast. The story is a web weaving together seemingly disparate entities. Who would have thought that Mediterranean monk seals, today endangered, would be linked to yellow fever? Or that yellow fever is connected to silkworm moths? Or to the small Atlantic island of Madeira 600 years ago? Or to a volcano in Sumatra? One of my favorite stories, I love that one. The link is a plant, a grass, called sugarcane transported on the Silk Roads from its ancestral home in Southeast Asia. The story brings together sugar, slavery, and voyages during the Age of Discovery, which will enable us in the following chapters to view yellow fever with full understanding. I can keep going, but I think let's do conversation on this bit, okay? So um, yeah, so basically what I'm saying, what we're saying here is we would like to get to yellow fever mosquito and its impact. That's after all one of the five insects. But upon doing that, we realized, you know, there's kind of a honorable mention uh, here. It's not even an insect, it's sugar cane. So we really wrote about five insects and a grass. <laughs> and that was, uh, uh, that really helped this right angle uh, story. And if you notice, that's part of the cover here. We've got a uh, silk moth here. We've got the other insects. And then this mosquito is actually s perched upon sugar cane to illustrate that point. It's both working in tandem. The story of sugar cane is, is fascinating. And my favorite aspect of it has to do very in, in, in uh, parallel with the stories we told about the fleas, my favorite aspect of it has to do with the fact that it's constantly being um, turned over by new investigations. We're still learning this stuff. A great explain a, a great uh, a way to say this is just what species even is sugarcane. 
And it turns out that immediately that immediately gets very complicated, very complicated. And so where did it originate from? There's many stories, many places archaeologically claim to have first uh, 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 developed uh, sugar in that region. And then you start looking at it, and you're like, well, it couldn't have happened there. And so other accounts say, well, maybe it's over at this spot. Well, it can't be there either for various other reasons. So we, we in a similar way to the flea story, we're sort of putting up these narratives and then kind of being, as, as authors, kind of being blown away researching it where we keep tipping over explanation after explanation after explanation. And that was fascinating. Just one aside, uh, who has been to uh, the restaurant uh, Kana Grill on College Avenue? Okay, their new uh, menu on the wall with the desserts, it says sugar was invented in India. Well, invented is a bit of a stretch, but refined first in India. Uh, it didn't originate there, but the, the refinement of it and use of it began there. So at first I was, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. But then the more I thought about it, yeah, that's pretty close. So anyway, it's, it's a good one. And, and so the story that we're weaving in this section is that you've got sugarcane, which evolved in East Asia. It's a grass that evolved in East Asia. It's transported around South Southern Asia by means of this essentially the Silk Roads. It's transported to Europe by means of the Silk Roads and fur, fur routes as well. Um, and there's all this economic intrigue around sugar at that time and honey, which we'll get to later, I suppose. Um, but there's all this intrigue around sugar and uh, the economics of it in Western Europe. And it is only by the Silk Road bringing sugar to that region that allows for essentially what we make the case is essentially the, s the entire uh, Atlantic slave trade. And without the Atlantic slave trade, you wouldn't have yellow fever mosquitoes. And so sugar cane and therefore silk moth made an integral connection bringing yellow fever to the Americas. That's the story here. Um, as far as time is concerned, what is the ending time here? Is it th the building does close at eight. Yeah. Eight, okay. So in the interest of time, uh, I can read more, but we can just move on to the next chapter if you think. I'm open to suggestions. Unless somebody has a comment or question. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite line of the honeybee, the honeybee, of, of, the West, of Western honeybees is, uh, something that Rob coined, uh, he says, honeybees uh, revered, or wait, now I've forgotten it. <laughs> My favorite quote, I've forgotten it. What, what you came up with? Revered and reviled. Yes, both revered and reviled. Uh, there's a dark side to honeybees um, that's pertinent today. Okay, so um, so we've just bridged how sugarcane and silk moths brought yellow fever essentially to the Americas. That's one way to think of it. It brought it elsewhere, and there's much more to the story, but that's what we're talking about in this next chapter, which is yellow fever in the United States. And so here's the beginning of this chapter. Put simply, yellow fever is a, is a dreadful disease. Unlucky souls can die within a week of becoming infected after bleeding from their eyes, vomiting blood, and succumbing to kidney failure and delirium. The pathogen is transmitted by mosquitoes who don't care if you wash your hands, live in clean communities, or have social standing. Effective vaccines do exist, but the disease still rages. One study estimated that 30,000 people die globally out of the 200,000 infected annually. Another, that in 2013 alone, as many as 60,000 died from yellow fever, mostly in parts of Africa, where vaccines, relevant education, and aid are all scarce. 
Those are modern numbers. But as jaw-dropping and heartbreaking as the current state of yellow fever may be, only a few generations ago, it was even worse. Even for those safe in Western culture who know its history, the name yellow fever itself still inspires dread. The disease may conjure images of faraway steamy jungles, rife with all things deadly, but yellow fever puts its mark on Western culture too. Although yellow fever originated in East Africa and still wreaks havoc there, it didn't stay there. Yellow fever made its way to the Americas, and it did, did so by traveling with the slave trade. I'm just scanning ahead to see if I should keep going there. Yeah, I think I will. You think? Talk about slave moving a little bit? Yeah. The transatlantic movement of slaves from, e sl of slaves, slaves from east to west was just one side of a triangular trade route. Ships embarking on this three-way voyage took manufactured goods, for example, weapons, from Western Europe to trade on Africa's what's known as the Slave Coast. That's the first passage. Then transported African slaves, uh, yeah, then there were transported African slaves to the Americas. That's the middle passage. And finally, delivered sugar and its derivatives, such as molasses and rum, back to Europe. And that's the final passage. So that's a three-part passage there. Yellow fever was first recorded in the Americas in 1647 on the island of Barbados. And from that toehold in the Lesser Antilles, the virus spread to tropical lands throughout Central and South America as trade in sugar and slaves expanded. The first island occurrence of the fever was followed in 1648 by an epidemic on the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Yeah, yellow fever was not restricted to faraway lands, nor jungles, steamy or otherwise. As the North American colonies grew and achieved independence, trade in humans and products brought the virus to the young United States where the 18th century epidemics of yellow fever racked the bustling cities of New York and Philadelphia, among other northern cities. Yeah, I think I'll stop there, actually. Yes, I will. Yeah. So this begins the yellow fever investigation and how it wreaked havoc on uh, mostly the U.S. at that point in time. I'd like to follow up on one thing real quick before I move on. Um, here we are writing about first, let me find this. Yellow fever was first reco re recorded in the Americas, 1647. Okay. So one thing that's interesting is that, as I've said, this research is constantly going. So there's, we're learning new things every single day. And uh, I was just reading this morning that now there are people who believe that the first introduction of yellow fever into the into the Americas may have actually been on Christopher Columbus's ship, and possibly he gained it from the slave trade in the Canary Islands, which is where he stopped before he came here. It's the same story and theme, but uh, it's so interesting to see that it may be even one, I mean, when this was being published last year, even one year ago, we're still learning things that tell more of this story. So I just think that's a bit fascinating. Do you have that other? Well, we said, uh, had we written this book five or 10 years ago, s stories would have been simple. And if we were writing the book five or 10 years from now, they'd be very different than what we're writing now because uh, everything we know is wrong. So um, it does change that way. Well, would anybody like a, like to ask a question or make a comment there? This is gripping stuff. That, 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 uh, I mean, not, not the book. I mean, I mean <laughs> please make your own judgments there. But the, the story there of, of the connection of sugar cane and the just rich history there and the silk moth and rich history there and the slave trade and the crazy rich history there 
and in the stories in the Americas, what was going on in Brazil, sugar cane, I mean, the, the sugar cane industry in Brazil alone is fascinating. And then you introduce the Caribbean and you talk about the rum trade and just so on and so forth. It's gripping. Cool. Well, we might have to move on. And, and, and the establishment of, of great powers in the Americas. How early on it was the English and then uh, the, the Spanish because of the Slave Trade Act in uh, the 1700s so the, or 1800s. So the, the English were no longer able to use slaves to grow sugarcane. And so it's, it's a very demanding uh, labor-intensive crop. And so when they were not able to use slaves for it, they switched to some other crop like cotton. Uh, and instead, the Spanish, who weren't constrained by the laws, still used slaves. And so Cuba and Puerto Rico were the two largest uh, sugar-producing um, islands, colonies, and they both were, were Spanish uh, uh, colonies at the time. Haiti, at one time, was one of the richest, if not the richest, uh, country in, in the, uh, the Western Hemisphere because of sugar. Uh, and, and then you had the, <coughs> the slave revolt in Haiti, uh, and which brought uh, yellow fever to the United States early on. Some of the, the epidemics that occurred uh, in Philadelphia uh, as a result of that. Anybody know about the, the yellow fever epidemic in Memphis in late 1800s? It was, uh, we go into a lot of detail, I won't read it all, but it, but just the uh, the impact on that city at that time, I think it was forty five thousand or something residents in eighteen seventy eight, and uh, it the yellow fever was moving up river, people trying to leave New Orleans where there was an epidemic, but when they moved up river, they carried the yellow fever with them, and so something like twenty thousand or so of of Memphis residents left to try to avoid getting sick. And they went by various means, riverboat, railroads, the, the early railroad in Arkansas that carried um, passengers, and there was a quarantine outside of Little Rock, and another one in Forest City. And so of the remaining 20,000 or 25,000 in Memphis, a large percentage of them, I think 5,000 died. Most of them were infected, and they were bringing... Uh, doctors and nurses from everywhere to, because the, the local ones were dying. Uh, they couldn't, woodworkers left, they couldn't build coffins for those that were dying. And so you had mass graves and anyway, it, it had to be hell on earth in uh, Memphis at that time. They thought if you could close the windows to keep out this bad air that was causing it. So imagine now, you're in Memphis in August and you're sealing up all the windows in your house. Uh, what, how pleasant that had to be inside there. And then they were doing things like burning sulfur to, um, to kill the whatever germs and sulfur in, a, in a, a closed environment, not good. So anyway, it was just the, the very idea of an epidemic. You know, we th as Ray said, you think of it somewhere far away. Well, Memphis isn't that far away to have an epidemic that w basically decimated that city. Um, another thing I'd like to add is that the stories of the mosquito is absolutely fascinating. I could go on for far too long talking about it, uh, and I won't. Um, I'm in fact, I'm looking at the time now. There's five minutes till 7.30. What should we do? Should we keep going? Well, uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free. Um, Welcome to keep going if, uh, if you'd like to. Um, okay. We would appreciate it if you wrapped it up a little before eight so we can clear the room. And sure. The building, of course, will excellent close quickly after that. Maybe we should just end that uh, story and then write about the bees that we see. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. That's a good one. We got to get one honeybee story in yeah, there. Yeah, we have to do it. We'll get yes. It to yes. <laughs> The saying, float like a butter butterfly, sting like a bee, was made famous by the renowned boxer Muhammad Ali. It was in 1964, while he was still known by the name Cassius Clay, and the brash 22-year-old was preparing to fight world champion Sonny Liston. 
He made that statement during an interview about his strategy. Everyone knew that Liston would batter and beat Clay, but Clay danced lightly around the ring, staying out of reach until he got an opportunity to deliver his fierce punches and won by technical knockout. His fame skyrocketed and continued unabated. Still living on, in addition to his humanitarian anti-war efforts, efforts his, is his quote, equating his lightning-fast blows to the sting of a bee. Unless he was referring to other species of bees, he overlooked the fact that honeybees can only sting once. Or maybe he thought that just one of his solid punches was all that was needed to vanquish his opponent. There's no record of Ali ever studying the biology of bees, so we'll cut him a little slack. But bees were used as weapons uh, throughout history, going back to the second century BC, um, where they were uh, put into tunnels to uh, to break sieges. Um, they were used uh, uh, in castles where they had uh, actually little niches on south-facing walls where they would keep a, a, a kept of uh, skep of uh, bees. And so when attackers were coming, they would throw down beehives on them. So you've, you've got the stories of boiling oil or whatever else they would throw down. But they'd also throw bees uh, against uh, those attacking. Uh, when Richard I left England to wage war against the Muslims in the uh, Second Crusades, uh, he had 200 ships. 13 of those held beehives. Uh, they were used, uh, they were catapulted. Uh, into over city walls, into uh, uh, cities that were surrounded by, uh, by, by walls. And uh, the word bombard has its origin in the Greek word bombos, or Latin bombus, for a buzzing or humming sound. And bombus is the name of the genus of, of hun uh, bumblebees, not honeybees. One can imagine that a colony of bees, whether honeybees or bumblebees, would not have been happy about being placed into a catapult. The bees were even far less likely to be congenial upon their landing. Keep their, the same technology but jump ahead by a thousand years. Bees were used in all sorts of wars, except um, not so much in, in World War I. We had other uh, weapons. But um, uh, 50 years after that, Bees and tripwires were deployed as booby traps in South Vietnam by Viet Cong forces. Different accounts offer varying versions. In one account, Viet Cong attached small explosives like firecrackers to the huge aerial nests of the giant uh, Asian honeybee, uh, causing them to drop and release angry bees onto advancing American troops. In another version, tripwires resulted in nests dropping onto American tanks with angry bees entering into the close confined space. It's the largest and most aggressive of the Asian honeybees, and so the tank's crew had the choice of staying in the tank and facing many large aggressive bees in tight quarters or trying to exit the tank quickly, only to find themselves under fire from Viet Cong. Not very good choices. Um, so the use of bees as weapons even up into the 1970s from something that was thousands of years ago, but using the same technology and the same biology. Um, and many other insects were used as weapons, and we talk about uh, some of those in the book. But, um, but there is a case of our friendly honeybees being not so friendly in, uh, when they were uh, used as weapons. Um, maybe... I'll just, I'll just add to that that uh, there are, and it depends on how you count and, and what uh, taxonomic system you use, but there's something like seven species of. Well, it'll be over in just a second. Okay. <laughs> there's a lot in there yet. Really. Sweet. <laughs> so, oh man, we gotta, we got to block that somehow. Okay. I'm not. So there are something like seven, and depending on how you count, it could be eight, could be nine species of, of the genus Apis, which are the honeybees. 
and the one we're talking about is the, the Western honeybee. It's the one with the westernmost distribution. It's often called the European honeybee because it's native to much of Europe. And um, uh, yes, and so we're making the point in the book that there's a silkworm link there. And here the story is the one where rather than things from mostly East Asia are making their way in the Silk Road, th via the Silk Road to uh, West, mostly Europe. In this case, we're talking about a Western insect that's making its way East. Uh, and there's all kinds of interesting things to say about that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where to go from there. Uh, yeah, it's just, just uh, one of the insects that goes the other way along the Silk Road, which is fun. Maybe one last thing about honeybees, and uh, that is anybody likes, everybody likes almonds. And uh, there are currently about a million acres of almonds in California. And uh, it's something like the fifth, uh, it, it's one of the, no, it's 11% of the agricultural economy in California is due to almonds. Uh, those almonds flower for about a two to three week period and they require honeybees to pollinate to produce the almonds. And so when there aren't enough honeybees, honeybees are not native to the U.S. They were brought from, from Europe. And so during the flowering time, honeybees are transported on semis to California and something like estimates range from 50 to 60 some percent of all the managed honeybees in the United States are in California at that time to pollinate those trees and produce the almonds. And they're worth so much, they rent them at something like $200 a hive or $200 a week. I don't remember the, the figure now. But they're worth so much money and they're bee rustlers that go out at night and you have to know what you're doing, but you steal these honey bees. One uh, theft was a million dollars worth of honeybees stolen in one night. You have to know what you're doing to do that. But now there are armed guards in the orchards to protect the, the honeybees, which I thought was kind of interesting. So yeah, they're, they're good guys. They're reviled if, you're, uh, uh, if you have an anaphylactic reaction to bee sting, but revered if you like most anything that we eat, something like two-thirds of of uh, the food we eat, pollinated by insects and honeybees, being one of those. Uh, some of you may know this. Uh, the library has a bee apiary. It's on top of the rooftop garden here. And we hope to have uh, Fayetteville Public Honey in our deli uh, here soon. Mm. Oh, great. Okay. So, we um, are there any questions? Other conversation? Anybody before we get locked in or locked on? And uh, uh, Daniel has uh, a couple copies left, Daniel from Pearl's Books in the back. Anybody that's interested, or if you brought one, we're happy to sign a book or anything like that. But other questions, comments, uh, surprises? What other insects did you think about doing? Oh, such a good the question. These five. Yeah, so. Uh, can I answer that? Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. So the there, we th there was one that made that was probably the most discussed, and that's uh, malaria carrying mosquitoes. It's hard to imagine with the just sheer number of deaths per year throughout all of history. Hard to imagine a better case for a insect affecting humans than malaria carrying mosquitoes. And uh, yeah, so we ended up not doing that for many reasons. One is that that's more of a slow grind. Uh, there's not good narrative examples of right angle turns in history that are easy to, well, at least easier for us to envisage. Um, and there's more than one species of malaria carrying mosquito. And there's more than one species of malaria. And there's a lot uh, to say about disease transmission in various parts of the ancient and present world, much of which is still unknown. Um, and we 
already wanted to do yellow fever, so we didn't want to do two mosquitoes. So that one was cut. We had two more that were debated. Uh, one, and we were divided here. If we had to write a book uh, on the six insects, then it would be one of these two, and we disagreed. This is one of the reasons we had five and not six, is because I don't think we would come to an agreement there. Uh, we would we would have. Um, for for Rabba, it was boll weevil uh, as as a good example of an insect that made a good right angle in history. And for me, it was uh, Drosophila fruit flies, uh, mostly thinking of medicine and genetic warfare. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the others. We discussed many. I made a great case for the tarantula pet trade, uh, but it turns out there's just not enough known about that historically, so it wouldn't be a gripping chapter. Also, aside from just holding them, there's not a lot else you could say. Um, although, if you're interested, there's more to say. Somebody else wrote uh, an interesting account of specifically red mean tarantulas affecting native communities in uh, western Mexico. Yeah, so those are, those are, do you have anything to add to this? My, my choice of boll weevil was because, in my opinion, boll weevil's responsible for rock and roll music uh, because of just movement of people and, and the music they carried with them. So it's something we can talk about later. Other uh, question anybody have? Yeah, can we get a round of applause to our authors tonight?